Gary Gygax was inspired by fiction like EC Comics, weird fantasy, weird science fiction, and weird science fantasy, as well as books by Robert E. Howard for Conan and other barbarian and fighter type characters. And this is why he has a strong preference for fighter type characters. So I'm going to talk about that brief, briefly today in the special one year anniversary episode of Daddy Roll to One. Hello there. Welcome back. I'm Martin. And today I'm going to briefly talk about Gary Gygax's preferences for fighter and martial type characters and where that preference comes from. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the characters that I've played during the years. A few people have asked in the comments before to uh, for me to kind of expand on talking about some of my characters. I showed one of my old sheets once. And then um, I'm going to end with a fun, what I think is a fun story about some characters that I created as pre-generated characters to um, take some friends through module S3 Expedition of the Barrier Peaks. So um, this is really intended to be uh, an anniversary ish uh, episode of Daddy Roll the One. So today, February 9th, 2024, this is the one year anniversary of me starting the channel and it's um, grown much faster and um, changed direction way more than I ever could have predicted. So I um, never really intended to start covering too much of D&D history. Um, just for full disclosure, the main reason I made my first history video, which is um, the history of D&D editions, which is also just one of my more popular videos. But the main reason I made that was because on Twitter, I was always talking about how I run 1981BX Dungeons and Dragons for my daughter. And I always explained it that way. Sometimes I'd say 1981 Moldvay BX D&D or Dungeons and Dragons uh, for the campaign room for my daughter. And I did that because I thought me, people would like look up what that was. And I'd been doing that for like about 18 months or so, maybe even two years. And I had followers that I interacted with regularly. And it came up at one point where one of them said like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what B slash X is. And they had never bothered to ask or to look it up. And they just said like, and it never occurred to me that it was anything that was relevant that I could use in the game that I'm playing right now, which was fifth edition. And I thought like, that's, that's crazy. Like I've gone out of my way to explain what this game is. So anyway, um, I made that, that video on the history of D and D editions with the hope that like, if it ever came up, I could just point people to the video and say, Hey, if you don't know what this is, what I'm talking about, you can find it here. And what I found is just a lot of people are new to the hobby. And these terms that some of us old timers throw around all the time, like BX or Beck me, or, um, you know, rules, cyclopedia, whatever it is. Um, we don't always take the time to just stop and pause and make sure people know what we're talking about. And, newer people sometimes don't feel comfortable asking. And so there's a communication barrier. So um, anyway, that video was so popular. Um, that's kind of what started me making these history videos. So um, but today, just talking about Gary Gygax and playing um, fighter type characters. So there was a very uh, fun interview with Tim Cask. We've talked about Tim before here on the channel. He was the first actual employee of TSR, if I remember correctly. So, you know, Gary was working there with the with the Bloom brothers, but they were founders, so they weren't technically employees. So the first person that they hired that wasn't, you know, an, uh, a founder of the company, someone who hadn't put money into the company was Tim Cask. And um, Tim, you know, one of his first jobs was he edited um, Supplement to Blackmore, and he also became um, eventually the editor and the editor in chief of, um, the last couple issues of strategic review and then for dragon magazine. So that's what he's best known for is kind of like, I think being the, the first editor of dragon magazine. And, um, but you know, he was there at the forefront and, um, you know, was instrumental in the development of a lot of the concepts of D and D that we take for granted today. So a lot of, um, behind the scenes conversations and things that would happen between him and Gary. So he and Gary were, were pretty close. And um, I've mentioned this before, but Tim Cask has an active YouTube channel. And um, it's really fun because um, he does talk about a lot of these old times of like actually being there. And um, so uh, one of the times that he was interviewed, he was talking about Gary's preference for fire to characters. And as Tim says, and I have mentioned this briefly before, but Gary couldn't understand why someone wouldn't want to play a like you know very muscular strong 
superhero type fighter character. So, and you know, that is borne out when you look at Appendix N from Dungeon Master's Guide. We've talked about Appendix N before, but Gary talks about growing up on comics and he specifically points out EC comics, which um, mainly that's going to be, I mean, they had a whole bunch, right? But um, kind of like post- um, there, there was a time period like post World War II, but they sort of changed the focus of their comics, and they started publishing stories like weird fantasy and weird science fiction, and then weird science fantasy. Um, but those stories, like when you look at the covers, the heroes of those stories are not wizards; they're not sorcerers. Those are the bad guys. The good guys are the fighter types. So he can continue to talk about that here. And then when you look at the list of books. Edgar Rice Burroughs, the Pellucidar series, the Mars series, the Venus series, like you've seen covers of these before I've been showing them here. Um, those all have like these very strong, very warrior type characters as the heroes. Um, obviously, you've got um, Robert E. Howard's Conan series, but like the Kothar series by Gardner Fox. Um, you've got, uh, you know, just just a ton of them here, the Fawford and Grey Mouser series. Okay, so I mean, you do have a lot of like your kind of weird fantasy, like H.P. Lovecraft and um, a, a Merit and things like that, where you know there really are no heroes. Um, there's just a point of view character. But for the most part, Gary was looking at these kinds of inspirations in terms of the types of characters that he wanted to play, and he assumed that that's what other people would want. You want to be the hero of the story, and the hero of the stories that Gary grew up with were um, fighter types. Okay, so it's funny when you get into later D and D stuff, you can really see Gary's sort of preference for fighter type characters. So in the original game, of course, you have three character classes: fighter, cleric, and magic user. Um, and then the thief is added later on. Okay, but then when you get to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and specifically, I'm going to go to this book. This is a Unearthed Arcana, which came out in 1985. So if we look at the list of available character classes in here, what's funny is you'll notice that the majority of them are fighter type characters. So let's just use this table as an example. Cavalier and Paladin. So that's two right there. Those are fighter type characters. Fighter, Barbarian, and Ranger are all fighter type characters. So you see Ranger here is indented under fighter. At the time, Ranger was considered a subclass of fighter. And the Ranger in AD&D and early versions of the game was much more of a fighter warrior type. They were woodsmen and trappers and hunters, but they weren't like the light, you know, armored skirmishers that we think of today. Like, you know, their pattern on Aragorn. Aragorn is first and foremost a warrior above everything else. Yes, he's a tracker. Yes, he has some healings that he does that, you know, um, in the houses of healing and things like that. But he, you know, he has his... um his sword and he's like fighting you know orcs and goblins and stuff like that he's a warrior so that's what rangers really were right and then you've got all the rest of these care you know you've got cleric and druid and magic user illusionist thief acrobat and assassin you've got monkey you've got bard which is special it's listed you see here on at the very end but bards in this version of the game are technically fighter thief druids that's what it is um Literally, you have to start as a fighter and then stop being a fighter, become a thief, and then stop being a thief and become a druid. And then at that point, you're a bard. But I'm not going to count that as a fighter. But you've got 14 classes here. Five of them are fighter types, way more than anything else. You've only got two sort of, you know, clerical or divine types. You've only got two arcane types. And then you've got three, you know, rogue types, if you want to call them that, right? So clearly, there's a preference for fighter type characters. So also, if you look at Oriental Adventures, now this says it's by Gary Gygax, but it's pretty much well known at this point that this is really mainly written by Dave Cook. And they put Gary's name on here um, because it would sell more books. And, you know, it makes sense. It's a business decision. OK, but if you look at the character classes here, we'll just use this table right here. So you have Barbarian, Bushi and Kensai. All three of those are subclasses of fighter. So there is no fighter class in this game. You want to play a fighter, you can technically play a bushi. Okay. And then you have samurai, which are um, a subclass of cavalier. Okay. So that's a warrior type. So in this, you know, at this point in time, cavalier was no longer a subclass of fighter, it was its own class. And samurai, it's still a warrior class. So samurai is a, um, 
is a subclass of cavalier. So you've got 10 classes here and four of them are warrior types. Okay. And you could even make the case almost that the Sohe is a warrior type. It, it's a cleric subclass, but um, they're like warrior clerics. So they're much more about, they're not like the traditional cleric. They, they have a li more limited spells and they can use um, many more weapons and they can wear any armor. Um, and they um, they have some cool attack values. So, but you know that aside, four out of the ten classes in here are dedicated to fighter type classes, fighter type characters. Okay, so um, that's kind of the inspiration of the game. And I think you know these days people think fighters are boring, and why would anyone want to play a human fighter? But when Gary was working on these notes for the game, like that's what he just assumed everybody would want to be because. It's wish fulfillment, right? It's like, it's why a lot of people start out reading superhero comic books because they're looking to see themselves in a situation where, you know, overcoming adversity. And that's why Billy Batson and the character of Captain Marvel, or nowadays, you know, for legal reasons, they call him Shazam. That's why that character became so popular to the point where he was more popular than Superman, because it was a little kid that all of a sudden grew into an adult and had powers that, you know, were. Um, you know, strength and, and speed and wisdom and all these things. And like, he could fight everybody. And that's every little kid's dream, right? So Gary's kind of thought was people would want to be the heroes in the game. And the heroes in these games are always in these stories are always human fighters, almost, almost to a T, right? At least from the fiction that Gary was reading. So nowadays you have later period fantasy fiction that's been written in the post D&D &D era where you will sometimes have um, you know, characters who are who are sorcerers or wizards as the main protagonist. Um, you know, there's the Belgariad series. There's, of course, Harry Potter. There's a lot of those, right? But in the old days, the inspiration that Gary was driving from, it was all um, fighter types from these original stories. So um, that being said, most of my characters over the years have been warrior types. I strongly prefer playing those types of characters. And um, one thing is just, I honestly don't like reading spell descriptions. I find it quite boring. I know a lot of people love it, but just page after page after page of that kind of stuff, just, I just want to start playing. And the idea of having to read through all those in order to make sure that I am picking the right spells for the right situation, like, it's just not something I'm super interested in. Um, and that's just me. And I'm not, you know, it's just, I've never... I've never gravitated to that, those types of characters. I've never found the appeal of having to keep track of all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's just the kind of player uh, that I am. So this is my very first character sheet from 1981. And um, at this point, he was fifth level, which I'm going to say must have been the highest he got because this is the only one I have at this level. And you can see... Um, if you've seen my video on the Moldvay basic um, d, d box set, that's what this character sheet is based on. The, the, so this is a basic d, &D character. Um, I'm going to point out a couple um, discrepancies in that, though. But as far as like the format of how I put it together, this is this is patterned off of the sheet that was in the Moldvay basic book. And rather than photocopy that, I just did it by hand. So it's all pencil here. So you can see here uh, one discrepancy right out the gate. As I said, his alignment is lawful. And then you can see, and it looks like it was probably written in later on, I put lawful good. That was because I started to discover advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the nine point alignment system, whereas basic D&D &D only has a three point alignment system. If you don't know what I'm talking about, see my video on alignment, the history of alignment in D&D. &D. I'll put a link here for you. So um, I did a symbol. I almost always did symbols instead of character sketches because I just wasn't as good of, a, of an artist. And um, I could never draw the way I really pictured them to be. So I would do symbols. His name was Dovir. <laughs> and um, I want to say I was reading a book at that time. It might have been by Robert Silver. What's his name? Silver? Silver? Shoot. I can't remember his name. I'll put a thing up here on the screen when we get to this part. But um I used to read a lot of those science fiction and uh, fantasy books. And I want to say there was a character, one of his books named Dor, D-O-R. And so that was kind of where I started with. And then I just expanded it. I might have mixed two different characters or something, but I think that's where that name came from. So this is the sheet. Um, I very specifically remember. So this character um, adventured through um, the Keep on the Borderlands. We never finished it, but like we would kind of skip around. So like, 
we would play part of an adventure like a module and then once the dm got a new one like we wouldn't really make it a campaign we would just kind of decide that we were done with that other one and then we would move to the next one and a lot of times using the same characters and that was just kind of how we played so we were we did samples so back in the very very early days like it was rare for any of my characters to completely go start to finish through a complete module and that's just because the dms that i had like that's how they ran the game so um but i do remember him being in the keep and um this is the back you can see some fun equipment he has here he's got a crossbow of speed with some magic bolts um he's got a ring of flying he's got a plus five dagger <laughs> like he's he's pretty well stocked and this is how we played back then so staff of striking ring of um the genie bracers of defense like he's just got he's he's look at all his gold he's got so <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous but that's kind of just how we played back then um for some reason he's got two battle axes He's got all these torches. He's got various magic weapons. So even though he's got a dagger plus five, he's also got a dagger plus one, as you see here. And I'm writing stuff out as it, as it came along. So as you see, like originally he had plate armor, but then over here, you'll see he's got plate mail plus one. And that's because I got that later. And rather than erase it or whatever, I just kept adding and adding and adding because I thought, well, maybe I'll sell this plate armor, that my, my non-magical one. Uh, so some of my favorite things that he had on here... It might be on another sheet, but oh, it's here. It's key. And then I wrote already used. So I was making a note to myself. I don't remember where I used that key, but I do remember writing down that it was used because I wanted to remind myself that that key probably wouldn't be useful ever again because I'd already used it. And I didn't want to keep thinking that I wanted to try to use it again. <laughs> so um, whatever. All right. So now if we look at his ability scores, you can see how out of control they are. It's just ridiculous. Um so I didn't roll these, obviously, but neither did my DM. So my DM asked me, what character do you want to play? And I said, a fighter. I looked at the book and and he said, OK. And so he assigned me these scores. He just said, here's your ability scores. Just fill them in on your sheet. And so I did that. So that's that character. Now, here is the same character. But um, I think this was my first one. Yeah. So this is, you know, he's level five here. This is when he's level one. And so you can, and I can tell that because it says he's a veteran, which is the level title for, for a first level fighter. You can also see that I've gone back to the, um, just the three point alignment system. So same ability scores, but he just doesn't have as much, as much stuff here. So, um, I have here this gem of true seeing, and then it says sees through walls. And then I wrote use forever. So I was, that was a reminder to myself that like, that wasn't a one-time use. My DM told me I could use that all the time. So the way I used to play with my DM, I'll just show you that really quickly is we used to play in class a lot. So this is actually, <laughs> I keep a lot of things folks. Um, this was a game that I played with my DM in a class. So he said, um, and I, I'm missing all the other pages, but I have this one. So it says, a sword won't hurt a stone statue. Um, think of something else. So I had been trying to attack this thing with that character that I just showed you, this this guy, Dovir. And he said, sword won't hurt a stone statue. And I thought about it. I was like, well, I guess I have to smash it. So I said, I'm going to use mace. And he said, yes, just killed the blob with tentacles. What are you going to do? And I said, grab the jewel and get that. And then I wrote sense. I thought I was being funny. I wrote, hell, get the hell out of there. But then I put censored out of there. And he said, the jewel is a jewel of invisibility. You can use it 10 times. There are no doors except the one you came in. So I said, okay, I'm going to go out the door. I'm going to get back my hit points. And he says, you get your hit points back. But while you were um, sleeping, two other statues wake up and you get to strike them first. And I said, no, I'm going to run like hell. And then he said, you can run south or east. So um this and this is like back and forth in class so like he's writing and asking me what do you want to do and then i'm writing it down and i'm handing it back to him and he wasn't really using dice all the time in class because he didn't want to make a lot of noise um so um i know a lot of people would say this isn't real D, &D but it was to me because this is how you know i would play a lot of times it was one-on-one -on -one. it was me and the dm in class and then on weekends that's when we would get the group together and like when this guy went through keep on the borderlands that would be like a weekend session like a friday or saturday night like maybe a sleepover or whatever but a lot of the play that i did was like this like this back and forth um in in class so i used the same character when he was fifth level in um x1 isle of dread with a completely different dm 
in class. I remember very specifically the Spanish class. So this would have been either seventh or eighth grade. And um, uh, the DM would write notes and say, what do you want to do? And I remember he was trying to um, hire somebody to um, for a ship to like bring him to um, the Isle of Dread or whatever. So um, yeah, so that's that character. And then this was my second character ever. And this one is for advanced D&D. And this is um, a Lemmy, my half elf ranger. And um, you can see here this very, <laughs> very of the time dot matrix printer. So I didn't have a dot matrix printer. This character sheet was made for me by one of my friends who was a player. And, um, and then, uh, um, you know, I just filled it out. So once again, these outrageous ability scores, the lowest being a 14 in charisma. And you can see I was always using charisma as a dump stat because my fighter had a 13 in charisma. But this is a Lemmy. This is his character sketch. So, or symbol, sorry, symbol. I was obviously not a dragon. He's a half elf. And um, so this guy used for a long time. He went all the way up until ninth level. So I remember this one um, specifically adventuring in... Um, the uh the U series the secret of salt marsh and, and then um the danger of dunwater and uh, the final enemy is the third one so he adventured through those um when he was at, at lower levels and um again i don't think we finished all of them but i remember i mean he definitely met like well i don't want to spoil any of those if people <laughs> haven't played them yet but i remember specific npcs that he met that he ended up like um bringing onto his side and working with him um and uh like um, being attacked in, in a certain area, being betrayed by somebody that you thought was on your side, like things like that. So um, anyway, um, this was my guy that, and this was my favorite guy. And I just told a recent story about him in my video on like kind of bad DM habits. Um, this was the guy that fought Storm from the X-Men, if you saw that video. So um, you may have seen this guy before. Okay, and then Thorin. I'm, just, I'm not going to go over all these because it's way too much, but Thorin, of course, very original name. This is my Dwarven Thief. And so, again, my point is on these first two, like, you know, I've got a Ranger and a Fighter. And then my third one was still not a Magic user. It was a Thief. Um, this one, what I remember about him, this is also Advanced d, &D. Now, this character sheet I made myself on my dad's electric tri typewriter that he brought home from work. They let him bring home an, an older electric typewriter when they got a new model in. And rather than throw it out or whatever, um, they said my dad could take it home. And so he brought it home and I used to make tons of character sheets like this um, on his um, on his typewriter. So um, this particular one, I remember I used him uh, to adventure through the, um, the I series by um, Tracy Hickman and um, Tracy and Laura Hickman, which was um, the uh, the Egyptian ones, so the Pharaoh series, so I three Pharaoh and I four and I five, and I forget the names of those two. It's like Oasis of something and White Palm Oasis, maybe, and then I think it's like the Lost Tomb of Martek. I forget, but it's I three through I five, and um, we were running a D and D club, and we got permission from our local library to use one of their um, conference rooms to teach kids how to play D and D, and so we put flyers up all over the place. This is like you know I'm in junior high. And they didn't really know what it was, but they allowed us to, they're like, oh, it's a kid's club. That's fine. And so um, we had people come over to play. And I remember I was like, I'm the experienced player. Like, I'm going to I'm going to do some cool stuff with my thief. And so I tried to pickpocket one of the brand new players that had just shown up. So I told the DM I'm going to do that. And it was one of my friends and we were starting the club and he looked at me like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, but, you know, I was a dumb kid. And I was like, I'm going to I'm going to do this. And um, I failed my role miserably. So. Um, I don't know where his skills are written on here, his thief skills. Here, here we go at the very top. So let's see what his pickpockets was. It was 65%. So I guess that's decent, but um, it doesn't matter because I failed that role. And the, um, the so the other player, the brand new one, like he saw what I was trying to do. And um, we got into a fight and I was, and it was like afterward, not, not a fight. Like, I mean, our characters got into a fight, like his character attacked my character because he's like, you're trying to steal from me. And um, at the time, I was sort of like, well, that's just the game. Like, that's what a thief does, which is, of course, not a very good excuse. And then it was only much later on when I realized, like, how how bad that was that I had tried to do that. But that's what I remember about this particular character. All right, I'm not going to go over every one of my characters, but, you know, just you can see there's just pages and pages and pages. They're all in this folder here. 
um, back before, you know, we did them online. Uh, everything was by hand. Okay, so that's that. And then I just want to show a couple other things. So I did show you, like, again, kind of how we played in class. And then this was sort of like when I was starting out, like, this is what my DM would do. So he'd say, like, what languages do you want to speak? You get six, circle them. And he just gave me a list. And then I had to circle what languages I wanted to speak. I don't know if I had any context uh, for picking these. I just picked them, I think, because I thought they would be useful or cool. And then he said, if you want to speak something that is not on this list, ask me. And then over here, he put, you get five of these spells. But I wasn't playing a magic user, so... Um, you can see I didn't circle anything. I don't know what he said. Maybe he thought I was going to play a magic user. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, that's really old. And then, um, this is another one where you can see I'm circling the languages that I'm speaking. It's the same list. So I'm guessing it's the same character as before. And then there's some little, little drawings. There are just all kinds of crazy, weird writings and notes on here on like what weapons I had and equipment. So that, these are all like just from the very get go, like my starting characters. So th th that's those. And then I um, thought you guys might be interested to see um, the original advanced d, d player character record sheets. So these are the goldenrod version. Um, but they had um, basically they broke them down into, you know, fighter, ranger, paladin, and you could kind of color in which one you were. So this is my paladin character. Auburn the Pure, and I drew this line. I think that's actually Aslan. I, I copied that from a book that I had, and then I created all these symbols. I thought this was a really cool character, and um, my friends hated her, so um, I didn't use her that much. She did get up to level four, it looks like, but um, I didn't use her very often because my friends thought it was stupid that um, her name was stupid, and that, like, why was I playing that character? And then uh, this is a druid that I had. And then um, my magic user, or it actually was an illusionist, and I named him, um, looks like Rock Amon, but basically I patterned him off of um, Thoth Amon from Conan, but um, I made him lawful neutral instead of evil. But uh, I was really into Egyptian mythology back then. So those are the player character record sheets. All right, and then just a few more. So um, again, I'm just kind of showing you a peek into my how I used to play D&D. So this was my character Thorin. And um, that was the dwarf I talked about. So I did talk about using him in the um, the I series, the the um, you know kind of Egyptian ones. But I also seem to recall that he went through the um, he played in the um, the giant series because one of the items that he has, I'm looking for it because I saw it written on here earlier. Maybe it's on the back. Yeah. So he has the. Um, Sorry for keep moving this around, folks. There it is. He has the map of the Frost Giant Jarl Rift. So um, I remember playing the Giant series, and the reason I remember playing that with this guy was because the DM went to the room, and I snuck over to look at the module, and I saw the picture of the trolls that were coming up, and so I was I knew to be prepared for the trolls. So I, I guess I was cheating a little bit. So. Um, <laughs> anyway, but so um, Thorin, that was my uh, dwarf thief that I talked about a little bit earlier. Okay. And then this is just, I think, funny. So I tried to play D&D &D because I didn't have um, uh, a lot of friends around that played it, except at school. Like they didn't live close enough where I could like walk to their house or anything like that. They lived on the other side of town. And so um, I tried to play with my family. And so I created characters, as you see here, from my dad, my mom, and my sister. So my dad had a fighter and he named him Rocky <laughs> and never used him. Like he just had no interest in playing. He just didn't understand it. And it just wasn't of interest to him. He's not really a fantasy science fiction kind of guy. Um, and then my mom made an elf that she called, I think it was Pokoro or Porcaro. Um, and the one time I tried to run her through an adventure, um, my mom, she ended up kind of dozing off in her, in her chair. She was sitting in her, her easy chair kind of rocking. And I was, I was of course, super excited, not paying attention that she was just not into it. And then my sister probably did the most. She's a little bit older than me. And so she had some different characters, but I remember once, like I was getting really frustrated because she wasn't like playing when I wanted to play. And so she wrote me this contract. I think I did something for her, like helped her with her homework. I don't, I don't know what I did, but then she she said, so the, her thing, she said, I will play D&D &D until I find the black razor. So I was obviously running her through module S2. Um, and um, 
and then she put um, with Marty tomorrow when I want to. So she was very clear that like, even though she's saying tomorrow, she's saying when want, we never played. So she never finished that adventure. She never found black razor. And um, that, that was it. So I just, you know, I don't know why I keep stuff like this, but um, I thought you guys would find that funny. Okay. So I'm going to just cap this off by talking about some fun characters that I made for this adventure. So I was in this Friday night D and D group. We used to call it like our, you know, it was, it was our, our beer and pretzels game. It was, it was a very much like a lighthearted cause it was the end of the week. Um, and we ten tended to do like a round robin kind of take turns. Like somebody would run a game for like maybe five to 12, you know, sessions, and we played like once a month. So that's, you know, between half a year to a year. And then you would switch and someone else would take over and kind of um, move it around. And we were always playing like third edition and we were starting to dabble in Savage Worlds, but it was, you know, pretty much 3.5 Pathfinder. And um, I was starting to kind of get disillusioned with that system as being a little bit too mechanically rules heavy and fiddly for my taste. And so I offered to run an old school game um, using the original old school rules. And this coincided with my friend having seen, um, there's a fun map of S3. Uh, I forget the artist's name. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. You can see he did a lot of these maps for Wizards of the Coast kind of um, to kind of celebrate some of these original old school adventures. And so my friend had seen this one for S3 and he goes, that looks like a really fun adventure. And I said, great, I'm going to run it for the group, but don't tell anybody what it is. Like he was the only one that had seen the map. And so he was like, okay, I won't say anything. And so I created the characters for everybody as pregens. And I did that partially because these guys didn't have their old books anymore. I didn't want them to have to buy anything. And also I thought like, this is going to be a quick self-contained, like I intended it to go maybe like fewer than six sessions. And um, as it turned out it was four because they just weren't interested and we stopped playing. But I made the characters for them as the pregens. And so one of the funny things I did was I thought, you know, because this is our Friday night game, we're trying to have fun. And so one of the characters, um, I had him be, um, it was, he was a half orc assassin. So I wanted to really kind of dig into like these, these, um, you know, kind of tropes of advanced D&D. &D. And so like the half orc assassin seemed like the quintessential character that you want to have in your group. And so I did that, but then I said, but you're in disguise as a human scout. And that's, you know, one of the abilities of assassins in uh, first edition D&D is they have this ability to disguise. And so I said, you're disguising yourself as a human scout. And um, I wrote this pretty long backstory. I'll, I'll put part of it here up on the screen. But the idea was that this guy, um, you know, had grown up in this tribe of, of orcs. He, he was half human and half orc, but he lived with the orcus tribe, the jagged fang tribe. And one point when he was you know, younger, this um, group of knights had ridden into town, um, into their village, and they had captured his mother, who was like the witch doctor priestess of the tribe. And then the guy, just like the head knight, just like cut her head off and killed her. And um, this care, so this character was like really upset with that and had decided to like, he pledged that like for the rest of his life, what he was going to do was train himself to be able to kill that guy one day. Like he just wanted to go do that. And so he learned how to become an assassin. And that's why he was an assassin was that he had gone out, like, you know, gone traveling to learn all these different ways to kill people with poison or with blades or with traps or like whatever it was, like he knew it all. And so um, then he finally found out through the grapevine that um that he could get close to that character and so in order to do that he took on this guise of this human scout for like years oh, maybe months whatever it was but um and he got his name out in front of that guy so this is all in the background for the character just letting him know like so you're here to kill this character this this guy who was a paladin um for killing your mom that's your goal or some more fun backstory in there about like the assassin's guild um, and its leader, who was Oren Ishii, <laughs> which I obviously took that name from um, Kill Bill. And, um, and he was trying to escape from them because he had turned them down when, when they offered for him to join the Assassin's Guild. And I thought that might come up, and it never did. Okay, so then what I did was I had another player play the Paladin character who had killed this character's mom. And I didn't tell that player that's what he's doing. But I did tell him very specifically, like your proudest moment that you get, you won't, you won't stop to like, you know, remind people that you did this was that you had gone through, um, you know, led a group of knights into this orcish village and basically beheaded the orc witch that was like their leader, which she wasn't, but he did it anyway. And um, so you won't hesitate to tell people that you did that at like the drop of a hat. And I mentioned that like, you know, you are um, currently writing your, um, your, your favorite horse, um, Silverheart the third, 
And that's because your previous two horses, which was Silverheart the first and Silverheart the second, like um, you lost them along the way. But you're you know you're now with Silverheart the third, and, and you've had it for like two weeks. And then um, you your favorite sword that you use is Argent Death the fourth, and um, it's Argent Death the fourth because Argent Death the third you lost in a tournament to somebody who clearly had to be cheating because there's obviously there's no way you could have lost your sword to this guy, but you know he cheated and so took your sword. And then um, and I said, and then you lost Argent Death the first and second the same way. So it was very clear that this guy was sort of like a goofy, like clumsy, whatever. Um, very boastful, bragging all the time. And then I wrote in the thing, like you speak in a thick Scottish brogue and this, this guy who, who was playing the character, he's of Scottish ancestry. He thought that was hilarious. So, um, anyway, what happened was, um, so he has no idea that this other character is the son of the woman that, that he killed in the past life or like whatever. And so they're all adventuring. And so in the background, I had put for the half work character that he had figured out that this paladin um had had a dungeon delver and was going on a quest and so um the assassin and before the game started had had killed that dungeon delver and so he under mysterious circumstances and then kind of got the word out that he was looking for work and um eventually got back and so they had hired him and so all both characters had backgrounds that dealt with each other but they didn't know um they didn't know everything and so the um the paladin character is like oh you know, you got word that like you know this guy's looking for work and he's a scout and you know it's perfect timing because you need one your old one just died and he never thought like that it could be related to anything it was just fine so they're going through their adventuring um we're going through this adventure i just talked about this recently and i've talked about it a couple times before but it is one of my favorite all-time adventures and so um there were 10 characters. There's five players and each one had two characters. So they had their main and they had a backup. And it was a good thing because um, eventually, like, I'm going to pause really quickly because there's a fire truck going by. Um, so eventually a um, uh, a couple of the characters died, mostly from radiation poisoning, right? And so, um, which is very common in this particular adventure here. And... Um, and so they were exploring, but the the players were starting to get, I could see like they were starting to lose interest in this. There's a lot of exploration. Um, one of them just very specifically is not a science fantasy guy. And so at a certain point, they decided to split up to see if they could cover more air because they were looking for certain things, right? And so one of the players suggested like, hey, why don't you two guys go together? And it was the paladin and this scout, the half-orc assassin. But again, they didn't know that that's who it was. And so they go off into their own. And so then the the half orc character, the assassin, realized like this is the perfect opportunity for him. He's he's away from everyone else where he can assassinate and kill this guy. So rather than just like pass me a note or do anything like he announces in front of all of the players at the table, I'm gonna assassinate, you know, the paladin character. And the paladin player is like, what are you talking about? Like what, what's happening right now? And so he said, but I want him to know why beforehand. And so he told him the story. He's like, I'm the son of this woman that you killed. Like you had no right to do that, like whatever. And I just wanted you to know who I was before I killed you and had taken him off guard. But like he'd followed all the rules for like, you know, how long he had to wait and observe people before he assassinated. I was a little fast and loose with the rules because it was sort of like, again, I, I could tell that people were losing a little bit of interest and I wanted to wrap it up. And also the player was being clever about having maneuvered this guy into the situation where he was by himself. And so um, he rolled his assassination roll and he made it. Um, he he barely squeaked by, but he totally made it. So the assassin just dies. He's dead. And so all the other players now have heard all this, but they have to pretend that their characters don't know, but they've heard this. And so then the player just has his half orc just like jog back to the group like nothing's happened. And they're like, hey, what happened to our, and it was their leader. Like, what happened to Sir Inscare was his name. Like, where did he go? And the player for the half war, he, he answers in character and he says, oh, well, while we were off exploring, like, um, I discovered I had evidence that he was going to betray us all and try to murder us. And so I had to kill him, which was a really kind of <laughs> weak excuse. I think it would have been better if he just hid in the body and say that he died of radiation poisoning or maybe fallen down into one of the shafts in this, you know, there's Spoiler alert, this takes place in a crashed spaceship. So he'd fallen down in one of the shafts and like couldn't find the body, right? Because they're like, why didn't you bring his equipment back? Like his sword and all this stuff. Like, where is all this stuff? And the guy's just like, oh, I just left him there. Like, you know, so it, it, again, instead of being sneaky about it, he just boldly stated out in front of the group, like, 
I he killed my mom, and so I killed him as I'm entitled to do. That's my right, and um, so there it is. And they were all like, "This is a little bit strange." And um, no, he actually he didn't tell them. He didn't tell them that the, that the guy killed his mom. He they he he kept sticking with the story that like this paladin character was going to betray them all. And the other players were like, but he's a paladin. Like if he did that, he'd lose all of his powers. Like that makes no sense. So one of the other players I had written in his background that like, he was a really elderly uh, illusionist, but I'd said that like you worked with this guy's grandfather like years ago. And so, you know him, even though he's not very bright, you know him to be like a, a, a person of good upstanding, you know, whatever. And, um, and so he was like, I don't think he would do that. And then they realized they had a cleric with them. And, they, and so one of the players said like, hey, do you have speak with dead? And the cleric player is like, I actually prayed for it this morning. And I looked at his sheet and he'd written it on there. So he had prayed for speak with dead. And so I think for whatever reason, like he'd done that because some of their characters just kept dying and they were trying to figure out why. And it turns out it was radiation poison. They just didn't have the context to know what that was. And so they all went back to go um, do you speak with dead on the body and the assassin player, instead of trying to sneak away and like get out or like what he just went with them. And so he, he goes with them and, um, there was an elf player who was an elf fighter magic user. And so he was kind of looking around. And so he's passed me like a note and kind of said like, you know, I'm going to start prepping to cast web. And as soon as it's revealed like what happened. I'm either casting web on the assassin guy or I'm casting web on the henchman to the paladin. So the paladin's like backup character was like just a fighter, but he was like his herald or whatever. And the herald was defending the paladin. So like he never would have, you know, he never would have betrayed us. And then the assassin player was like, well, you know, that's what he did. And so the cleric player cast speak with dead on the body and the player that was playing the paladin character that had played him, and remember, I was telling him, you've got to speak in this thick Scottish brogue. So he stands up on his chair and he delivers this like amazing soliloquy. And he's like, I, you know, I, I, it, it, and I can't do the voice. I'm not even going to try to do the Scottish brogue, but like he just imagines him saying it in this thing. And he talks about this, like, you know, I was on a mission. Like I led this group. And it's the proudest moment of my life. And I, and I had gone, um, you know, gone into this village and this orc witch was trying to cast a spell on me. She wasn't, but that was how he saw it. And it was like, and she was going to kill me. And so I had to chop her head off. And it was like, it was a moment of glory with my favorite sword, Argent Death the Third, or maybe it was the second at that point. I can't remember. And I was on my horse and it like, and so, and he brought in all this, this background of like how he was on like his, his fourth sword and his third mount. And he could never remember which one it was because he just kept naming them the same thing over and over again, because he kept losing them over and over again. And um, so, and everyone's just cracking up because they're, they're like, they knew that part of his character, but he was, he was so committed to doing this. Like he didn't break character. And he's like, and so at one point I killed this orc witch and it turns out that she was this guy's mother and he's he's a he's an orc blooded assassin and he's killed me and he, <laughs> and he grabs his chest with over his he like puts his hand over his heart and he, and he like kind of swoons in the chair and stuff and and we were in tears we we're it's like I'm not even doing justice to this guy's speech because it was completely spontaneous because he had no idea that he was going to be assassinated that day and um uh and he so he just jumped into character and delivered this like off the cuff speech that it was just amazing. And um, I wish I had been able to record it or something. It's just back then we didn't even think about doing that. And so we were laughing so hard. And so then the elf says like, okay, web onto the half work character. And so um, uh, he casts web. And so now the half work is, is stuck in there. And we were reading the rules description. And we we're like, it's not just something that like holds you in place. Like eventually it can start to constrict. And, and so they were leaving in there. Well, they decided to take a vote of like what was going to happen. And then one of the other players said like, Hey, speak with dead. You get two more questions. Like what else do you want to ask him? And the guy's like, Oh, I know. I feel like I want to just ask him the same question again, just so the assassin has to hear about how this guy killed his mother, because I think that would be funny, but they didn't do it. And they're like, no, we have everything we needed. They just wanted to know how he died. And that was what they had asked him. Like, how did you die? And so, um, uh, they um they ended up to vote to like just let the half orc suffocate in the webs and die and he did, and so um then they had that so that player had to take over someone else's backup character because his backup had already died, and so they uh they kept adventuring and the way that it ended and I'll just tell you like because it's related to the next group of characters I created so they um 
they went into a room in here and there's a room that, and, and I, I keep, keep saying spoiler alerts, but there's a room in here that is, um, it's like a steam bath full of doppelgangers. And so they walked in and the room was full of steam and I could see like these guys just were not interested to keep going. And so in the rules that say that the doppelgangers are going to try to grapple the characters and use the pummeling rules, which if you've ever played it first edition, AD and D, um, those rules are extremely cumbersome. And, um, I was just like, you know what? These guys are done. Like, they don't want to keep going. And that's fine. You know, as a DM, you have to kind of realize, like, when you to cut, cut your losses. And so I just said, you walk into this room. It's full of steam. And um, we're done. Like, you know, and I didn't really get into, like, what had happened. I just kind of said, like, there's something in there. And you guys all died. Like, and I hated to do that. It's DM fiat. I just said, you're all dead. But I didn't want to belabor the point. Because had they not died, if they'd fought it out and they'd pummeled these guys, then they would have just kept going in an adventure that they just weren't interested in playing. And these weren't their characters. I wasn't killing their because I, I did pre-gens. So I didn't feel like I was taking away their agency because they hadn't spent time to create these characters. And um they were pretty much fine with it. Like they just, they were just like, okay, hey, cool. What are we playing next time? Like they were just ready to move on. So then years later, um, I decided to run module S4, Lost Cameras of Soge Camp. And um, uh, so I did a D and D again. And I asked them like, Hey, do you want to, um, you know, do you want me to make your characters again? Or do you want to make them yourselves? And they're all like, no, just go ahead. You can make the characters. We're fine with that. And so I made one of the characters, um, a, a human cleric. And then when you read the description, it said that like he actually wasn't a human cleric. He was a doppelganger that um, was a, a, a passenger on a spaceship that had crashed, landed um, years ago. And um, he'd been lost because he can't figure out how to get the ship to work again. And he's trying to find a way home. So I had him be one of the doppelgangers that had killed one of the PCs from this adventure. And um, but he'd been in guys so long as a human cleric that he didn't remember sometimes that he was a doppelganger and so i wrote a little mechanic in there it's like every morning when you wake up you make a wisdom check and if you fail the wisdom check you think you're a human cleric but if you succeed you remember that you're a doppelganger and your goal is you're trying to find a way to get home even if that means betraying the other members of your party and um the player who played he loved it he thought it was so funny and um uh and i did little things like because he's an alien or you know He's a doppelganger, but I made it that he was an alien. And so I put little things in there like um, all you eat is honey. You, so you have all these jars of honey. You won't eat any other food, even, even if anyone offers it to you, because the only way that you get sustenance is from honey. And none of the other characters ever question. And he would go out of his way to say, like, I'm taking a jar of honey out. I'm going to drink it. And they would just be like, oh, that's weird. But they never said anything. And um, anyway, that's it. So that's just a look at some of the characters I've played over the years, some of the characters I've created over the years and, um, you know, sort of like my preference for fighter type characters. And um, again, just briefly at the beginning, like that was sort of how Gary Gygax had envisioned people would want to play. I'm not saying it's the right way. It works for me, but um, I know most people prefer magic using characters because they want to dive into the fantasy element. And that's awesome too. But um, thanks for sticking through this. And really, I just wanted to put this together. It's, it was very last minute. Um, it wasn't until this morning or actually late last night that I realized that I was coming up on my year anniversary. And I thought I should have a video come out on that day. So um, this is the one that you got. And um, I do want to thank you for sticking through this and for um, for watching. And uh, I would love to ask if um, you haven't uh, done so yet, if you could please subscribe to my channel, first like the video and then subscribe to the channel. And then of course, share it. Um, if you could share it on your social media networks or just, you know, give people a link to come here, check it out. And um, that's the fastest way for me to grow my channel. And then um, leave a comment. Let me know what you thought about some of these characters. Tell me about who your first character was. And um, we can't do pictures here on YouTube. But if you want to join me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Blue Sky where you can post pictures um, and you have your original character sheet, put a, sh put a picture up there and show me. There's links below where you can join me on all those social media channels. And um the best way to support me. Uh, it's been a year and um, I love all the support that I've been getting from you guys. Um, but if, uh, if you want to do a little something to kind of help me, I'm trying to put some money back into the channel. I would love to get a new rig versus the janky one that I'm using to do my overhead shots. Um, every once in a while you'll see it shake or you see things move around and that's because this is not stable. Um, and I don't have lighting. So I have to record during certain hours of the day when I have sunlight coming in through my office window. And when it's overcast, like it was earlier this week, um, the lighting is terrible. But if I turn my overhead light on, then everything's covered in shadows. So um, 
My point being, if you want to support the channel, what you can do is buy a shirt or a, or a hoodie or a notebook or, you know, whatever from my, from my shop, a poster, even a mug, and I uh, have all these different designs. You can see some of them here and um, all of them are exclusive to my shop. So um, I would love if you could help out your support and uh, buy a little something like that for you or for a friend who likes tabletop role-playing games. So that's going to be it for now. Uh, thanks again for watching. Happy gaming, stay safe, and I'll talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking and what I was listening to while I made my notes for this video. So I actually made my notes earlier today, which is not typical. Usually I record on one day and I edit the next day and then I post on the third day. But um, today I'm attempting to do it all in the same day. We're going to see how long it takes me to edit. So there's a chance this might not get posted today. But um, I realized late last night that it was, you know, my anniversary, year anniversary. And so I, I threw this together a little quickly. I hope that you guys don't mind. It was really just a lot of talking about my old characters. And um, I do appreciate if you stick, stuck around and watched that and um, got to know a little bit more about my habits back in the day. And I would love to hear about yours. I know everybody has a different experience of how they played the game. And um, some people were probably more serious or, or about it than I was. But um, in any event, I wanted to celebrate a little bit. So. Um, I made myself an old fashioned this afternoon um, while I'm editing here. And uh, so this wasn't while I was making my notes because I started making my notes earlier this morning. Um, but I made an old fashioned and uh, I used this rye whiskey here. I think I've talked about this before maybe, but this is black market rye. This is a gift from a friend for this past Christmas. And uh, so it's it's a combination of, of a distillery in Kentucky and then um, some folks out here in California. So. Um, it it's kind of got like, you know, two different states working on this. And uh, it's got some rye notes. Uh, obviously, what's a rye whiskey? I'm sorry, it has some spicy notes. It's got some cloves, some cinnamon just on its own. But then what I added to it to make an old fashioned, this is part of my, my celebration here, is um, I add one of these. This is Pappy <laughs> um, Bourbon Barrel Aged Old Fashioned. So, um, it's a bit of a cheat because an old fashioned is such a simple cocktail to make. I'm not one of those people that would go buy like um, a pre bottled old fashioned unless I guess maybe like I'm going to a beach or something and um, which is not something I normally do. I'm not a beach guy, but like, you know, if I'm going somewhere, maybe on a picnic or whatever, and um, I don't want to bring all my equipment, I guess, you know, having a pre batch cocktail like that is fine. But, um, you know, typically an old fashioned spirit, sugar, water bitters, it's very easy to make because you just make it in the glass, right? So you put your ice in, which is your water, and then you add your, um, your sugar, which, you know, traditionally you would, uh, before you add the ice, it would be a cube that you would douse with bitters and then you would muddle it. And then you would add your whiskey in your ice and then you would stir, um, really quick. doesn't have to be whiskey. Uh, I have said this before, but an old fashioned can be made with any spirit. So, um, you know, gin, mezcal, um, you know, what have you. So, um, but, uh, you add your spirit and then you stir and that's the recipe for an old fashioned. So super easy to make. There's really no reason to pay extra for the bottling and the marketing for a premix one, but this was a gift at Christmas and it's made, um, in pa it's aged in Pappy, uh, Van Winkle bourbon barrels. And if you know anything about whiskey, you know, Pappy Van Winkle is extremely expensive. I've only ever, ever had it once. Uh, I was at a restaurant and my friend and I saw it was on the menu and we decided to splurge and, um, each ordered a glass. This was when our, um, ad agencies were, um, doing a little bit better <laughs> back in the pre-pandemic days. Um, we each own a little boutique at, at agency. So we decided to splurge a little bit and order a glass. But anyway, um, so this is basically the syrup and all the like spices and stuff that you're going to mix. So you see here, it has Florida cane sugar, water, burnt sugar, orange peel, spices. Sorry, the camera keeps adjusting. I apologize for that. Um, but it's got um, spices, gentian, chincona bark, and um, tartaric acid. So that's what's in this. It's essentially just, this is the bitters and the simple syrup or the sugar in one. And then you just mix it with, you know, stir it over ice with the rye whiskey. And then I used a Luxardo cherry. So here's your Luxardo cherries. Definitely use these if you can find them. Um, you can even order them on Amazon. They're so far superior to like those day glow red ones that you see a lot of times in old school dive bars. Um, 
but if once you have one of these, you'll never go back to eating those other ones. So, um, so just a, a quick note, everyone's going to say that it's, they're going to say maraschino. That's just how Americans have kind of anglicized this word over the years. It's technically maraschino. It's Italian. And in Italian, a CH is pronounced as a K sound. So it's bruschetta, not bruschetta. But everybody said, like, I've had people correct me and say, oh, you mean the bruschetta? And like, you know, I just let it go. In my younger days, I would kind of be snarky back, but I don't do that anymore. But in any event, um, I wanted to celebrate. So I made an old fashioned with these fancy pappy bitters. Um, that were a, a gift from a friend, also Christmas time, different friend that gave me this, but, uh, this is my celebratory drink. So hmm. cheers and thanks for your, um, your support of the channel. So listening to, I put this record on while I was trying to come up with an idea for the video today. And, um, this is the velvet underground loaded originally from 1970. So, um, you can sweet Jane rock and roll. Oh, Sweet Nothing, one of my favorite tracks. So this is a classic, you know, classic rock album. I show a lot of jazz on the channel. I know when I show a lot of jazz. And the reason, like, I have other records, but, like, you guys all have seen, like, The Police. Like, I've got Police, I've got Sting, I've got U2, stuff like that. But, like, you guys have seen all that. So I tend to try to show records that you probably haven't seen before. And a lot of that's going to be jazz because a huge part of my collection is jazz think probably 80 to 85 percent of my collections jazz also um when i'm making notes for my videos i find it much easier to focus and concentrate if i'm listening to um instrumental music so i will put on instrumental jazz to listen to i also just really enjoy it but that's what i tend to put on when i'm working whether it's for my ad agency or working on my videos here but every once in a while i'll try to break out of the the zone and um you know, also like show you guys something that's not a jazz record. So um, anyway, uh, this came out in 1970, which is a um, an important year for me. I'll just put it that way. So uh, so my friends gave this to me. So what was funny is when I started trying to build my record collection out, um, three of my friends all decided that for Christmas that year, they were going to give me non jazz Christmas records. And the idea was they were they were they were going to do it like every year they were going to pick a different genre. So like one year it might be funk and one year it might be, you know, um, whatever it was like alternative or whatnot. Um, so they've only done it one year, but the first year they did it, they decided to pick classic rock. So they gave me this one. Um, somebody gave me, um, one of my friends gave me uh, the Let It Bleed by um, Rolling Stones. And then um, the third one, actually the third one was Kraftwerk. So that doesn't really fit the classic rock. Um, kind of uh, genre, but in any event, they were trying to give me like a classic album that they thought I should have in my collection. And so um, those were the three that I was listening to under uh, Velvet Underground today. So uh, long, long explanation, but thanks again for watching and um, cheers and to another year on Daddy Roll the One. And um, thank you so much for your support and for sticking around. Talk to you next time.